Hello everyone, my name is Charlotte and welcome to this video. I just moved and my room is a giant mess right now so I decided not to be on camera here which means you can just listen to this uh, video like a podcast and I thought today I would recap this reading project I've been doing for a few years. I have been seeking out and reading and reviewing sci-fi and fantasy books with a thematic emphasis on trauma and recovery. This started out because this is an area of study and work for me, it's something that I'm really passionate about, and I was also wanting to see how other writers engaged with it in their books because I was working on my own writing at the time. And I just kind of kept finding more books and reading more books and thinking more about this topic of how people write uh, about trauma and recovery. So the project really ballooned. Uh, from there, it probably won't end unless I decide that I'm done and I get sick of it, which hasn't happened yet and I don't really see it happening in the foreseeable future, but we'll see. And just today, I thought I would give a recap of my reading so far. The things that I really loved, what I liked, what was disappointing to me, the things that I really, really disliked. So I hope you find something new and interesting to read, or I hope you just find the video fun. And we'll get started. So starting with the best of the best of this reading project so far, things that I would now consider some of my favorite books. Uh, it, the first is The Alchemy of Stone by Ekaterina Sedia, and this is about an automaton alchemist who has been emancipated from her owner slash creator and is living on her own doing alchemy work to survive, um, but she's still kind of caught in this controlling relationship with her creator and trying to grapple with that and become independent. Um, and she takes on a job for the city's gargoyles and has to try to do this really impossible work of alchemy for them while uh, the city, the sort of Victorian-esque city that they're living in, uh, gets closer and closer to like a class-related, labor-related revolution. There's just a lot of really interesting components to this that I'd never really seen put together in a book before. The setting is really interesting, the magic is really unique, like there's a lot of little elements to the magic that I'd never really seen before. Um, but the main thing that I really loved about this is the main character, the automaton Maddie. She is just an incredibly sweet, kind character. She's just a pleasure to follow around and kind of be in the head of. Um, I love how she just kind of tries to see the best in people and help people and be kind. Um, really just a darling character to spend time with. And uh, the other thing that I would have to mention about this is that the ending is something that I think about quite frequently. It's definitely not a happy ending. It's not totally tragic either. It's pretty much just a, a, a very memorable, bittersweet ending. And uh, that's the kind of ending that typically stays with me the longest. So yeah, put all of that together. And this is just a really unique, special little book. I definitely understand why it wouldn't be for everybody, but I really enjoyed it. The next book that I really loved is The Enchanted by Renee Denfeld. And this is magical realism. It's about a man who is in prison, he's on death row, and he is reflecting on life in the prison, life on death row, and uh, his previous life, the lives of the inmates, and kind of just about the world's beauty and how he finds beauty in the world despite being in an incredibly, you know, awful, awful violent environment. Um, and then at the same time, there is a death row investigator trying to save another inmate's life before he's executed and kind of diving into his backstory and finding out more about kind of the factors that shaped him into the person that he became. The writing in this is really, really beautiful, and it does a lot of things that really resonate for me in how it talks about violence and crime and punishment and the humanity of people who we typically don't think about having humanity uh, and just like I said in ways that feel very resonant to me. I uh, actually just read Notes on an Execution by Daniel Kakafka right before the end of um, right that before the end of 2023 and I 
would really recommend this to anybody who read Notes on an Execution and liked that. Um, it's like a very beautifully written magical realism counterpart to that is how I would describe it. The next book that I really love is How High We Go in the Dark by Sequoia Nagamatsu. I just read this uh, for my 2024 Reddit bingo and uh, it really was a case of I think reading it just at the perfect time. I had just quit my job and I was about to move states and was feeling kind of all of this existential dread and tumult and uh, it just really really hit <laughs> at that time and I read it I read it like all in one night. And it's a series of these interconnected short stories about different characters in a future world that is transformed by a deadly pandemic, which starts around our time period, I think, but then it eventually goes forward like hundreds of years into the future to see how things change and the trajectory of people living through this pandemic and, you know, how society is changed by it. I really like how the author conceptualized the idea of this world transformed by death and capitalism combined. Like specifically the way that those two things go together in this book is really interesting and clever. Some of the stories are so beautiful. There is one, uh, the one about the pig, if for anybody who maybe has read the book, uh, that just made me cry so hard. And then uh, I saw in the acknowledge acknowledgments afterwards, the author was like, yeah, I saw a lot of people say on Instagram that the pig story made them sob. So I know I'm not alone there, but just some really, really beautiful stories. And uh, there's also all of these really subtle hints laced throughout towards this sort of speculative elements that eventually tie things together. It's not super sci-fi or fantasy throughout most of the book, but then there become more of those sort of uh, speculative elements towards the end, and I really liked how that tied everything together. So yeah, this was just a case of a book that I read at exactly the right time, um, and it really helped me through my own existential dread. <laughs> My next pick for some of my favorites is actually a series. This is the Realm of the Elderlings series by Robin Hobb. It's a 16 book epic fantasy series. Uh, it's divided up into four trilogies and one quartet, quadrilogy, oh I don't know what the word is, but they're all set in the same fantasy world. Nine of the books follow a royal bastard named Fitzchivalry Farseer, kind of all throughout his life. And then the others follow a broader cast of characters in the world as we see all of these grand events kind of set in motion while learning more about the magic in the world and how it's kind of been suppressed and forgotten, but it's coming back. And the books about Fitz specifically, those nine books, are basically summarized as an extremely depressed man just kind of making the same terrible decisions repeatedly. He just experiences horrible tragedy after horrible tragedy while remaining violently in denial that his gender fluid best friend has these prophetic visions and also is in love with him. I, that's not a good plot description by any means. I don't even know if that mean that would make someone want to read them. They're just hard to describe because for as long as the books are and as many books as there are, I feel like the thing that really stands out to me is the characterization, the character development, the relationships between them. They feel so truly real to me in a way that a lot of books don't. Um, there are characters that I love and characters that I hate who just all feel so well realized. This is especially true for me in the Fitz books because we see his whole life, essentially, and how he grows, how events shape the world around him, how his actions shape the world, how other people in his life grow and change. Um, you truly just feel like you're living his life with him in a lot of ways, and they're just very they're very special books to me. I think I mentioned in a previous video that some people think they're just kind of, they call them, you know, like misery porn. And I, I understand that because Fitz does a lot of suffering and for some people it's really hard to be in the head of someone who, like, is making these terrible decisions and has these really, really strong cognitive distortions and all of that. But I 
find him a very lovable character. I care a lot about him and his friends and family and I just wish I wish there were more. I wish there were more. I hope that Robin Hobb writes more in this world, but at the same time, if she didn't, I think I would still have to be happy because I felt like things ended like right on the note that they needed to. The next book is Heart's Blood by Juliet Marillier. This is a Beauty and the Beast retelling set in ancient Ireland where a scribe has to unravel the curse on the man she loves and the castle that he's lord of. I could have chosen a few Juliet Early books. I really love a lot of the stuff that I've read by her, um, but I think this one wins out just because it does have such a combination of things that I really, really love in a book and in a romance. She always has these incredibly beautiful, like delicate, tender roman romances that are very emotional, um, and they always make me cry to some extent. But just for me, the particular dynamics of this relationship the two characters are both these kind of wounded souls who very slowly, like gently, come to trust each other and they learn how to support each other throughout their respective struggles and fears. Those are things that I just really love in a romance and uh, so this might make it my favorite of hers. In addition, I liked the, the way that she retold Beauty and the Beast here and a lot of the elements of like the magical plot worked for me too. So for anybody who really wants like a very lyrical, atmospheric uh, fantasy romance with like a very, very emotionally resonant romance, definitely read this. Another favorite is The Pattern Scars by Caitlin Sweet. This is about a girl who discovers that she is a seer and she gets entrapped in her teacher's basically horrific, violent, mad scheme to create a war using their magic and she has she tries to fight to stop him and free herself from his power. This is not a book that um, I like I understand why other people might not like this or resonate with it. It is very very dark and ultimately it does not have a happy ending but I just think about it a lot. It really really it really really stuck with me and the way that she writes the main character struggle and her resistance and the way that she just thinks about things and lives with her situation I don't know I just think it's written very powerfully and it also has another ending like I said it does not have this book does not have a happy ending but just the way that it's written and the ultimate conclusion that it comes to is something that left a really, really big impact on me and is something that I think about very frequently. My next favorite is Tender Morsels by Margot Lanigan. This is a fairy tale retelling of Snow White and Rose Red. It's about a abused girl who one day uh, escapes from danger into this sort of like strange pocket dimension, strange alternate reality that is like very peaceful and static and placid and she raises her daughters there in peace and safety and security. But then stuff starts to happen, the real world starts to kind of encroach and they all have to decide basically whether they want to stay or go and what kind of world and lives they really want to have. And I love this one. I feel like I'm saying a lot of the same things for all of the books that I love. There's definitely a theme forming, but it's just this very like beautifully written, dark, atmospheric fairy tale retelling. Um, the, I loved the relationships between the main character and her daughters, and then several other female characters who crop up over the course of the book. They all have really interesting what relationships that they form together and I like the way that it explores this idea of like what kind of life do you want to live? Do you want to live something that is really safe after going through things that are awful? What's the value of that versus doing something that has more risk but maybe is you know more rich, more adventurous, that kind of thing. Um, like this is also one that has an ending that it's definitely happier than the pattern scars or um, the alchemy of stone but it's still there's something that, that happens right at the very end that is just like a very very painfully bittersweet tinge to what is generally a happy ending and also makes me think about the ending of the book constantly that's just 
that's just something that like you add that that sort of like drop of bittersweet or you make the ending like heartrending and I will think about a book forever. Um, interestingly, this one was categorized as a young adult novel when it came out and it was kind of controversial for that because there is a lot of um, mature subjects in it and um, some things like there's there's some bestiality with a bear and uh, some random stuff like that in addition to, you know, the more expected things. Um, so it's kind of, I think, one of the big conversations that you see around this book is whether or not it should be young adult. And I understand that, like, the value of that conversation, but for me, I, I don't know, I read it as an adult and I just think it's really beautiful. I was just kind of going off the cuff and I realized there's one other thing I forgot to say about Tender Morsels. Um, I love, like, almost everything about it, but there's just this one kind of plot twist thing that happens to some of the perpetrators of the violence towards the end of the book that just comes completely out of left field and is very, like, shocking and I, I think it's kind of tonally dissonant from the rest of the book. Um, it's still everything else about it. I think I enjoyed enough for it to still be a favorite, but I will say, like, if someone reads this book and is like, well, that's not good, I don't like that, I would say, like, yes, I agree with you. There's just something that happens toward the end, towards some of the perpetrators that is, like, very, I don't know, it's very shocking, very violent, and not necessarily something that, um, I don't know, not necessarily a choice that I super agreed with, um, like, creatively, but, you know, your mileage may vary. Next is the Archivist Wasp series by Nicole Cornhurst Stace. This is post-apocalyptic, kind of fantasy, kind of sci-fi. It follows a girl who lives in a cult in this post-apocalyptic world, and basically she runs away from the cult, and the, her job in the cult is basically to categorize, like, study and categorize ghosts. And so she runs away from this cult, and she teams up with a ghost, who she finds about, out about his backstory. It turns out that he was a super soldier in the world before the apocalypse, and she agrees to help her survive and escape in exchange for her helping him navigate the realm of the ghosts to find another ghost who he knows was very important to him in his life, but he can't remember anything about her at this point in time because ghosts gradually lose their memories. Uh, this is, again, I feel like I'm just saying the same thing over and over again, but like very, very beautiful writing, very strange magic and world, and the relationships between the main character and the super soldier ghost, and then the character that they eventually, uh, they set out to rescue and eventually meet. Um, just really, really well written relationships that, again, just made me sob, <laughs> like cry a lot. Um, there is a part toward the ending that is just incredibly written. Um, and not necessarily in, like, a super, like, r emotional way that you would typically think of a, a book being super emotional. It's, it's still, like, these are very, very, um, these are characters who don't like to express their emotions. These are characters who, you know, have just kind of been living and surviving and doing what they have to do. But the way that, that, uh, the author writes these characters and their relationships with that in mind is just really interesting and cool, and I like that a lot. So um, the first two books are traditionally published, I believe, and then the third one, uh, the author is currently putting out chapter by chapter on their Patreon, and um, I've kind of been waiting to have the whole thing done so that I can read it all at once, because I don't like to read things in installments. Um, so just know that if you read the second book and you're looking for more, you can always sign up for the Patreon and read, uh, read more of the characters and their story there. I definitely could not make this list without including Tahanu by Ursula Le Guin. This was one of the books that I read early on into this kind of project and one of the ones that really spurred me to keep going with it because it just made me realize how powerful this sort of style of story could be. And I don't really believe in choosing one favorite book of all time. It's not really possible for me, but if I was hard pressed, this might be it. Um, so it is one of the Earthsea books. It's the fourth book in the Earthsea series by Le Guin, which is her um, own original fantasy world, starting with The Wizard of Earthsea. And it follows a character named Tanar, who is a young girl in the second book, The Tombs of Atuen. She is now a middle-aged widow, and she takes in a little girl who was left 
um, like burned and abused and wounded um, by her family and takes her in and helps her kind of settle and grow and start to heal. And then at the same time, um, the wizard character, who is the Wizard of Earthsea from the other books, loses his magic and he uh, meets up with Tenar again and together they kind of create this new like unconventional life and family. And in the, it's either the foreword or the afterword to this, uh, Ursula Le Guin wrote about how her goal with it was to talk about her fantasy world that she created from perspectives that she had kind of ignored before. So people without power, like women and children. And what emerges from that is just this really, really wonderful meditation and exploration on power and what different types of power looks like and how we think about power as hierarchies but doesn't have to look that way um, and thinking about gender and um, you know gender dynamics, gender essentialism, gender roles, trauma healing and basically I think what it really comes down to is how do we start thinking about these really complicated things in new ways and how can we change the world for the better when these ideas are so deeply entrenched and when these systems of power are so deeply entrenched. But it also does that in this like very, almost like very cozy kind of homey domestic story about Tanar and and um, the other characters like creating this new life together. Um, I feel like when I describe it, I feel like honestly when I'm describing all of these books it's hard to do them justice, but this is just one that made a really deep impact on me and it's definitely my favorite Earthsea book. I like all of them, but I haven't finished the series yet, but this is my favorite of the ones that I've read so far. One of my favorite young adult books uh, is Thorn by Entisar Kanani. This is a young adult retelling of the Goose Girl in a Middle Eastern setting, Middle Eastern inspired setting, where we have this very timid princess, you know, follows the traditional Goose Girl plot where her maid forces her to change places with her, and she kind of has to grow and find her inner strength to reclaim her place as the princess and find a way to do what's right for the people in this land and figure out what justice really looks like. That's definitely a reoccurring theme in Intazar Kanani's books, uh, is like these very brave, extremely principled girls who are finding ways to fight against injustice and figure out like, what does that mean? What is justice? What does injustice really look like? Like, what are the ways that we should fight against it? Um, her writing is really beautiful. Um, the main character in this book has like a very gentle, delicate character arc that emerges really gradually. Um, and it's, it's just really, really lovely. I wish that there was more young adult fiction like this. Um, and if you like this one, definitely check out the rest of Intisar Kanani's books. Um, this one has a kind of interesting history because it was additionally, uh, or was originally published as an indie book and then was picked up for traditional publishing. Um, she had a couple more books traditionally published, um, but is now doing a lot of stuff uh, to re-release really beautiful versions of some of her indie stuff on Kickstarter. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, I definitely recommend uh, checking her out. And last but not least for my list of favorites is a trilogy called The Red Abbey Chronicles by Maria Turchaninoff. She is a Finnish writer and these books were originally published uh, in Finnish and then translated into English. I will say the translations that I read are amazing. The writing is so beautiful in these. Um, they're about a place called the Red Abbey, which is kind of this island haven uh, of learning and growth and like spirituality and safety for women in a very violent patriarchal world. And it basically looks at the lives of the women who escaped from an evil king to create the abbey. And then it follows uh, one girl, her life at the abbey, and then her adventures when she returns home to try to share what she learned with her home village. They are really passionate about the relationship between feminism and education. And they talk a lot about women's experiences of oppression and resilience in a very in a very effective way, I think. 
Um, there's also just so much beautiful writing in these, like beautiful writing about nature and the different places that the different characters come from and kind of just the details of their everyday lives that even if they weren't, even if they didn't have like the themes that I find really powerful and you know they didn't explore them in a way that I really liked, there would just be so much to recommend them because they're so atmospheric. I just love hearing about the details of the cultures and the different people's lives and the nature that they're surrounded by. Um, again, I just wish, these are young adult as well, and I wish that there was more young adult fiction like this. It's just so, um, it just is just such a special trilogy. So yeah, really, really liked those ones as well. So that's my list of absolute favorites from the project so far. There are others that I really loved that just didn't quite make this cut, um, and I might talk about them some other time. But uh, yeah, for now, moving on to, unfortunately, the books that I liked the least so far. Um, first is The Haunting of Alejandra by V. Castro. This is about a very depressed, kind of trapped, self-hating housewife who realizes that all of the women in her family, or all of her female ancestors, have been haunted by La Llorona, who is a ghost uh, known for mourning her drowned children. And she works with her therapist to free herself and protect her own children and kind of end this legacy of generational curses and generational trauma. Unfortunately, this one felt like a really early draft, and I was kind of shocked that it had gotten published in the state that it was in. The writing was really rough, um, the characterization felt very wooden, um, the themes were also delivered in like a very clumsy, heavy-handed way. I do think that the premise for this is really strong. Um, I think it could have become something a lot better than it is right now. Uh, because of that premise, but I just feel like it needed a lot of refining to get to a point where it was a better book. I also really disliked Rose Matter by Stephen King. This is about a woman in an abusive relationship. She flees her husband and creates a new life for herself with the help of this magical strange painting. I have never read any Stephen King before, and I don't really know much about his works beyond, like, you know, how they've infiltrated pop culture, but I found out after I read this that a lot of people consider this to be one of his worst books, and I guess he doesn't like it either. I definitely understand why. It is very long, but doesn't have to be. It's just very, very boring in parts, like there's so much focus on things that we don't need to focus on at all, and there's also a really disappointing focus on the super lame, boring, insta-love romance between the main character and this random guy that she meets after running away and staying in a shelter and like finding her finding her feet again. Um, it just shifts into this very lame romance. Um, there's a lot else I could say about it, but overall, like, I just, when I think about it, I just remember this kind of like a gut feeling of just like feeling really icked out and like impatient at the same time, it just really didn't work for me. And I just kind of go back to that feeling of like, ugh, like, ugh, I don't want to be reading this. Next is The Surface Breaks by Louise O'Neill. This is a young adult retelling of The Little Mermaid, where essentially <laughs> The Little Mermaid realizes like, maybe don't, you know, run after a man and fall in love after, you know, not having spoken with someone before and respect yourself and all of that. Um, this was, like, you, you have to go pretty far t for me to call something, like, too heavy-handed in its feminism. Um, that's not something that I'll just say automatically. Like, I, I can take a very strong feminist message and I'll be like, yeah, good point, <laughs> I agree. But this was just so heavy-handed, but also very, very clumsy and, like, it kept doing things that really muddled its points and kind of just conveyed the messages in a way that was like, yeah, it was just very, very obvious, but also confused because of the choices that the writing was making that like under, under, un, you know, undermined it basically. Um, it's so much of it was just this, <laughs> this character, this little mermaid character, like sitting around on the shore waiting for the prince character to pay attention to her while like bandaging her feet <laughs> they're like actively rotting and there's just so much of the book where she's sitting around describing her rotting feet <laughs> and like between that and like the really 
bad feminism <laughs> and just like very strange writing choices. Like at one point in time, the, the characters are underwater and one of them is described as taking a breath of air <laughs> and stuff like that. It's just, this was really bad. Um, I'd heard good, like generally good things about another book by Louise O'Neill that's called Asking For It that I think is just more like general fiction about uh, sexual assault and like rape culture and things like that. So I'm not averse to trying that at some point in time. I just maybe hoping that young adult fantasy really isn't her thing. But yeah, this was, this was kind of a shock. Next um, is <laughs> Daughter of the Blood by Ann Bishop, and I'm laughing because um, you just have to laugh when you talk about this book. It's unreal. Um, this is about a the ruler of hell with one L and his sons. They're all these powerful magical immortals who are fighting to protect a young girl named Janelle because she is destined to become the witch with a capital W. I don't really know what that means because the book never like contextualizes it or describes it clearly but she's like destined to save the world or something but this is just like insanely hilariously bad through and through like sometimes i would just be sit sit there in shock and be like i don't know what i'm reading right now um the way that i would describe it is that if there is a possibility of a character being like gratuitously tortured or raped in any particular scene or context it will happen um and there are plenty of times where plot development, character choices, situations don't make any sense and they just happen so that someone can be gratuitously tortured or raped <laughs> in, in, in more ways. Um, she doesn't have anything, well to me, she doesn't have anything interesting or meaningful to say about any of the violence that she includes. It really just feels like it's there for shock, shock value to be dark and like sexy and gratuitous, you know? And I think we give a lot of male fantasy authors, like male grimdark fantasy authors, a lot of flack for that, but this book is proof that <laughs> male fantasy authors are not the only ones who use violence and specifically sexual violence in like a very um, like exploitative way to try to be titillating. Um, it just felt feels very cheap and gross and exploitative, like I said. Um, the thing that's probably worst about this book is that there is an incredibly creepy relationship between one of the ancient immortal men and Janelle, who is a child in this book. Um, and it's, it's like, she, she does things to try to justify it. She does things to try to claim that it's not like a pedophilic relationship and that everything's actually okay, but it's definitely not. And, um, there, the like the way that the book ends is probably just like one of the most bizarre like gross things I've ever seen in a book and it's just kind of like the epitome of well <laughs> it's fantasy so it doesn't count or like no 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 you don't understand like she she has an ancient magical soul so she's actually an adult in spirit or you know you don't understand he had to do this thing to hurt her in order to save her from something worse happening um and if that sounds familiar <laughs> it's because sarah j maas was heavily inspired by this series um in writing a court of thorns and roses there's a lot of like character arcs that and um like pieces of world building and just the kind of general dynamics of how characters talk to each other um that are really really inspired by this series like Resand is definitely inspired by Damon who is the the pedophile ancient immortal man who I was just talking about um so he they're in good company together um yeah this series is just it's unreal like I haven't read anything like simultaneously like so wildly entertaining like parts of it are just so insanely bad and so weird that I, you're like fascinated like you can't stop reading but then there are other parts that I did like feel genuinely grossed out by I was like I, I don't know, like, I, it's just such a strange, strange reading experience. I've never read anything like it before, and, uh, yeah, <laughs> like, absolutely horrible, but absolutely unreal as well. I also really, really disliked Wolf Song by T.J. Klune, which, um, is basically Twilight fan fiction, but no vampires, just gay werewolves, which is a pretty enticing premise, I will say. TJ Klein is mostly known for like very sweet, hopeful, cozy, optimistic fantasy, uh, The House by the Cerulean Sea, I think is the really, really famous one. 
this is not like that. Um, from what I understand, this is from his indie, or uh, it was either self-published or published by like a, a small indie press, um, like his backlog before he got a trad publishing deal. Um, and I will say, like, I hope it doesn't sound mean to, too mean to say, but like, I understand why this particular book did not get picked up for traditional publishing. Um, and I'm also very interested to see what happens because it is now being republished traditionally. Um, I just haven't been this annoyed by a book in a very long time. Like everything about it, like it wasn't violently horrible or anything like that, but it was just so incredibly like grating and off-putting to me. There is just this like weird obsessive primal mate age gap romance. The humor was just so incredibly repetitive and juvenile to me. Pretty much the same thing for the writing, just like very, very um, repetitive with like the same ticks and phrases over and over again. I was just low-key irritated the entire time that I was reading this and usually even if I dislike a book like I'll still find something to be interested in and it's not like actively an unpleasant experience for me but this was like m along with most of the books in this category like it was an actively unpleasant reading experience to read this book and it just rubbed me the wrong way the whole time. <laughs> okay, I'm laughing again because the next uh, the next series is the Platon Prisoner series by Raven Kennedy. This is a romantic series <clears throat> that uh, was indie published and uh, really popped off on social media, on TikTok and everything, and is now v being traditionally published. And uh, so yeah, it's a romantic. It's a retelling of the myth of King Midas, where we follow our main character, who is a woman who can turn anything to gold with her magic. And at the start of the series, she has this situation with King Midas where she's like consensually in a cage living in his palace, um, but gradually kind of realizes the abusive dynamics in their relationship and, and fights to free herself from him. And then it kind of merges over, you know, because of Sarah J Maas, it kind of merges over into like, for lost fae princess reclaiming her kingdom who is also primal mates with a warlord type thing. Um, this is my second place award for just like hilariously entertainingly weird badness. Um, it also like second place to uh, Daughter of the Blood. It also features like a lot of very clumsy, gratuitous sexual violence. I will say that I definitely get the sense that Raven Kennedy is trying to be thoughtful about it and trying to say something with it and, you know, explore trauma and trauma healing more than Anne Bishop ever did. I just don't necessarily think that it's done well at all. Um, it's just for, for a book to handle those subjects, I think it, it needs to have less emphasis on the romanticy tropes um, and stronger writing. I will say the writing in this is very difficult to get through, just very, very clumsy, awkward purple prose. And yeah, if you if you hate the sort of possessive alpha fame mate trope, then this is definitely one that you won't like. That trope doesn't, it's not like my pet peeve or anything. Um, like I'll read a book with it and I won't be like actively annoyed by that, but it's, um, it definitely features that in a way that's very um, formulaic. So yeah, you put that all together and I will say like, I am going to finish this series because they're just like, they're just a fun like, absolute garbage popcorn read for me where it's just like I'm gonna shut off my brain and be like this is crazy <laughs> you know sometimes you need a book like that um but it's definitely uh, it's definitely not uh well done in my opinion and last but not least at all of my worst of the worst category is um A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J Maas. Of course I, I wouldn't be able to do this video and this section of this video without an honorary nod to to Akatar. Um, I probably won't say too much about it here because I've said way too much elsewhere, but um just know that Resand is still my mortal enemy, but I'm probably like maybe 10% more normal about it and think about it less now that uh, my rant about him went kind of viral and I got some external validation. So it's still 
it's still in my heart, it's still in my mind, but um, I'm a little bit subdued now. The exorcism kind of worked. But yeah, watch if you want to, if you want to know my thoughts about that series in um, probably too much detail, then yeah, definitely watch the, the resand video. I wanted to do like a special shout out section. These are books that are not necessarily my absolute favorites, but I think they do something really unique. They're underrated and I wanted to mention them because of that. First is uh, the Balance Academy series, starting with The Healer's Road by S.E. Robertson. This is an indie fantasy series. It follows the development of a friendship between two healers who are forced to work together in a traveling caravan. They start out just hating each other, but then they slowly bond, and throughout the series they end up settling together in the same town and continuing to kind of learn and grow and... and and uh, like settle in in their lives together and this is very thoughtful like this is the kind of cozy fantasy that I really like that doesn't feel like super grossly sweet or twee um, it feels like very thoughtful it's very cozy with like a ton of little details of their lives uh, the characterization I think is really good it feels very grounded and realistic and there's a lot of, of explorations of things like art and religion and cultures and mental health and how we can make the world a better place. Um, this is, I would say, very, very underrated. Like, it's not a super well-known fantasy series. I would say outside of fantasy Reddit, maybe. Um, but I love the way that the relationship, like, very, very slowly develops between them. If you don't like, like, very, very slow-paced books, you will definitely not like this. But if you like something that's very just, like, slice of life, going in and out of the days and the tasks during the days and seeing things change very slowly, I would say definitely check this out. Uh, my claim to fame is that I got to beta read for the third book, um, and then uh, S.E. Robertson beta read for When We Walked in Memory. So that was, that's probably one of my favorite experiences that I've had as an author so far. Um, so if you don't like the third book for some reason, you can blame all of that on me. No, I, I don't think I had that much of an impact on anything, but uh, I think this is a very special, lovely little series. I would also mention Black Wine by Candace Jane Dorsey in this category. This is, I don't know exactly how I would categorize it. It's somewhat, some elements are fantasy, some elements are like dystopian, post-apocalyptic. Um, it's just kind of a mishmash of speculative elements. Um, but it is about kind of unraveling this, the mysterious past of an enslaved girl who has no memories. And, and there's a revolution unfolding in the backdrop in this very, very violent, bizarre world that's kind of a mishmash of medieval and uh, futuristic technology and you kind of just try to piece together what happened in this world and this revolution that's happening at the same time as we learn more about how she got to be where she is. Um, this is really, really weird. I would say the writing is very strong. I believe Candace Jane Dorsey is a poet, and you can definitely tell from how strong the prose is. The world is very well realized. Like, we see throughout her travels, the, char the characters' travels, just like a bunch of very interesting different cultures, and we sort of look at the the way that people think about different cultures and cultural relativism and you know cu culturally based ideas of things like there's there's a very interesting section where all of the characters talk about a particular concept or a particular idea but all coming from their own cultural context and how they define things differently based on that. Um, there's a lot of thought about language, um, and I think that the ultimate story that's revealed when you kind of piece together the enslaved girl's past is very interesting, very powerful. That being said, um, this is definitely another one that I would lump together with pattern scars and that it is not for the faint of heart. There is definitely a few scenes that kind of stuck in my mind and still make me feel sick. Um, very dark worlds, lots of violence, and ultimately not the happiest ending? I don't know. I think the ending to this one is also very complicated. I will say that the very, very last thing that happened in the last couple of pages, I generally just don't know what it means. <laughs> like, I had a very good idea of what was happening by 
almost the end of the book but then the past the the final couple of pages happened and I was like okay well now I don't know what any of that means so if that sounds interesting to you uh, as it was interesting to me then uh, yeah that's black wine Next is Godstock by P.C. Hodgell. This is an old fantasy, I believe, from the 1980s. It's kind of become a cult classic, and it's about a girl who kind of awakens with no memories, and she finds herself creating a life for herself and exploring this very strange city that is full of forgotten, abandoned gods to try to learn more about her forgotten past and her destiny. I believe that I originally learned about this book when I was asking for recommendations for things that give the same vibes as Planescape Torment, which is a, a 90s isometric role-playing game uh, that is similarly like known for being a cult classic with some of the best writing in any video games ever. Um, I love Planescape Torment, it's probably one of my favorite video games, and I'm just constantly looking for something that scratches that same itch of like weird, esoteric, extremely bizarre setting. Um, the, the city that Planescape Torment is set in is just this like labyrinthine, bizarre city full of like all these odd characters and strange little nooks and crannies that you like crawl into and find something bizarre happening. And that is absolutely what God Stop delivers on. Um, I had a lot of fun with this. Um, like, there's a ton of weird secrets, a ton of weird characters. The city is another character in and of itself. Um, I will say I don't quite know. It was re all, it was also recommended to me for my trauma reading project. I think when I asked about that on Reddit, and I don't. I will say I don't quite know um, why it was recommended for this reading project yet. Like, it was very clear that the main character had amnesia because of something, and there was probably some traumatic elements happening in her childhood before before she lost her memory, but that plays a very small role in the story, and we don't really know too much about it yet. But this was a lot of fun, and I will absolutely be reading on to find out more. Next is Black Water Sister by Zen Cho. It's about a millennial woman who kind of reluctantly moves back to Malaysia with her family and realizes that she is being haunted by the ghost of her recently deceased, very, very stubborn, kind of intractable grandmother. She has to help her grandmother take down a gang leader and survive in the world of spirits in the process in order to stop being haunted. I'm a big fan of Zen Cho. Uh, her books, I think she just has this very, very wry, clever writing style, and all of her books that I've read so far always have these very kind of difficult, cranky, like spiky women characters who she writes with just like a lot of affection and humor and finesse. Well, I, I don't know how to describe it exactly. I think that's the best way. That's what I kind of wrote down in my notes. But yeah, just very, very well written, like difficult women characters who are written with a lot of affection. Um, and I really like how this uses ghosts and haunting and Malaysian folklore and explores the legacy of violence against women in Malaysia and using ghosts to do so. I know that Zencho has like a, I think, just like a romantic comedy that isn't fantasy at all out this year which I might check out. I don't seem, it hasn't looked like it's gotten the best reviews, but I'm really hoping that she turns back to fantasy really soon because I've just loved, I think I've read almost everything that she's written in fantasy and I really, really love all of it. So definitely check that out. Next is Cloud and Ashes by Greer Gilman. This is a difficult one to describe. It's a sort of short story collection and then a novella about this very intricate mythology that Greer Gilman created in a world that I think you could kind of compare to like ancient uh, ancient England and the, it's difficult to say too much plot wise but it's kind of about this this celebration of the harvest harvest cycle and this mythology of the harvest and this girl that is kind of caught in the middle of this mythology, she kind of ex escapes from her role in the mythology and her the world transforms because of that. So this is a difficult one and it's one that I would, I don't know, I definitely recommend it, but I recommend it to a very specific subset of readers who 
want to be challenged and want to be confused most of the time and want to have to spend a lot of time figuring out what the writing is saying because the writing in this is very archaic and difficult to understand. Um, like the dialogue in particular, I really struggled understanding what the dialogue said because it's written in like old English dialect that doesn't really come naturally and you know it, it uh, kind of took some deciphering to understand. Um, however, the writing in this is very, very, be very beautiful, and not in a way that's similar to, so, to you know, prose that I love otherwise, and I would otherwise say is beautiful. It just kind of uses language in a way that I'm not used to, and I think is very extraordinary. Um, I buddy read this with a friend of mine, and that was a fun way to read it because we spent a lot of time together just trying to piece through our interpretations and we, what we thought different things meant and like trying to put it all together, um, together, together. So yeah, this is a very interesting, unique one, and I would cautiously recommend if you kind of want to puzzle things together. My next special shout out is to Midnight Robber by Nalo Hopkinson. This is sci-fi about a young girl who is exiled onto a prison colony world with her abusive father and she runs away and finds sanctuary with the alien creatures that are on this world and then she starts to take on the secret identity of Midnight Robber uh, who's a character uh, uh, from folklore and starts to use that secret identity to like fight violence and stand up for justice in her community. So what I thought was really cool about this, um, there are some really fun, unique sci-fi elements. Like I really liked the alien creatures in this story. And it blends the sci-fi with like Caribbean folklore and uh, Caribbean patois, so like a, a kind of Creole dialect in the dialogue and things like that in a very cool way. Um, there's a lot of folktale, like sort of excerpt folktales woven throughout. And uh, the main character grows in an interesting way, kind of using this secret identity to heal and to kind of like come into her own strength and power. So there's just a lot of really cool things going on with this one and I liked it a lot. And for my final section I want to label it dissenting opinions and this is basically things that are really hyped up, really popular, really beloved, or well regarded for handling this particular topic that I did not necessarily enjoy or find to be all that well done in this particular area. Um, first, and uh, I know this is controversial because of how popular their books are, I have read uh, Juniper and Thorn and A Study in Drowning by Ava Reed, and all of her books are described as these lush, atmospheric, gothic fantasies about young women who like claw their way to survivorhood through like their oppression and mental health issues. And I just want to love them so much based on that, that description, but I have been disappointed so far. There are some things that I like about the books of theirs that I've read, but I just find the exploration of the topics frustratingly shallow. Um, I don't think that the, the character arcs or development have been especially strong to me. Um, I think that the sort of takes on feminism uh, kind of leave a lot to be desired for me, uh, especially with A Study in Drowning. I thought the plot was really weak. Um, and I also really, really disliked the romance subplots in both books. I thought they were, uh, they just pushed my buttons a lot and I really didn't like the dynamics of the romances. So yeah, um, love the ideas, love the premises of their books, but so far the execution in things like the character development, the exploration of themes and feminism, and the re relationships including the romances have just been really lacking to me. I'm thinking about reading uh, the new one that's coming out, Lady Macbeth, and then going back and reading The Wolf and the Woodsman to try to talk more about these books in depth and why they just don't quite work for me. So if that's a video essay that you might be interested in, let me know because I do have some more thoughts about uh, Ava Reed's books. Also in my dissenting opinion section is the Girls of Paper and Fire series by Natasha Nan. This is a young adult fantasy series that 
was pretty popular um, a few years ago and uh, I haven't seen too much about it lately but it was definitely a really big release at the time and got a lot of positive reviews. Um, it's about a teenage girl who was chosen to be a concubine for this tyrant of her kingdom, the Demon King, in a world where humans are subjugated by demons. And she kind of gets swept up into this rebellion against his rule while also struggling with her life under his control and falling in love with one of her fellow concubines. I will say I think that the first book in this series is definitely the strongest. There are things about it that I definitely like um, and I, I can tell how much care is put into it but I will say that it feels very limited by how, re how much it relies on like young adult cliches and tropes um, that I think just kind of do it a disservice and kind of undercut the positive things that are there. Then the following books I think are just very very messy. Um, I kind of almost get the feeling that that the author had a very very solid premise for the first book but then the the second two books just feel much more messy and chaotic and aimless in a way. Um, like there's a lot of plotting stuff that doesn't make sense. I feel like the second book is mostly just filler and what's really strange is that the way that things happen in the third book, there is a much clearer way that the second book could have been written that would have made its its potential plot, <laughs> if I was the editor, a lot more meaningful, but it just didn't go that route. And so the second book was just so much filler, and then there were a lot of strange pacing and writing decisions in the third book too. So I just kind of felt like there was a very clear idea for the first book, and then more uncertainty with the following two that definitely showed up in, in how the plot played out. That being said, I definitely shed a few tears at the ending of the third book. There is like a very strong theme of, you know, the, the girls who are concubines like coming together and I think there's some really lovely elements there, um, especially in the first book and the end of the third book. So I, I wouldn't like I wouldn't not recommend it. I think just going and knowing that there are a lot of those traditional like popular young adult fantasy tropes and uh, that the sort of direction and momentum and plotting in the second two books gets a little bit messy and aimless. Next in the list of stuff that I just didn't really love, um, Her Body and Other Parties by Carmen Maria Machado. And this is one that I'm a little afraid to voice on the internet. I think this is just a, a collection that is really, really well loved and well regarded. Um, and I definitely want to make clear, like, this is not because I thought it was bad in any way. I think I just didn't personally resonate with it as much as I hoped I would. And for how amazing I had heard it was, it didn't quite meet those expectations for me, I guess. Um, so there's me losing all of my cool girl cred if I ever had any. Um, like this is a very very well written collection by someone who clearly has an incredible talent for writing and I think a lot of a lot of it like a lot of it has really really great premises, really great ideas um, and there are some moments uh, that are definitely powerful but overall my feeling was just that it didn't quite click um, some of the premises and the, the ideas of the stories didn't quite feel like they were explored as much as I would hope and um, I just am not someone who loves like a lot of sex in my stories and so just um, kind of got a bit bored of that even when you know it was clear like it was there for a reason um, it just wasn't super resonant for me. My next kind of dissenting opinion is with Circe by Madeline Miller. So to be clear, like when I finished this book, I was like, oh my god, this was amazing, like five stars. It's just a very um, like transporting emotional experience that it's very easy to caught up, get caught up in. Like I think the writing is very powerful and very evocative and um, I was really kind of swept away. But as the dust settled and I thought about it more, I ended up kind of deciding that I didn't love it as much as I initially thought. Um, I still think I really like how Madeline Miller writes and I do think like it's just, it's an enjoyable story for sure, but I definitely think there have been some really well-written, thought-out 
articulated criticisms of it as like a, a specifically as a feminist story um, and I agree with a lot of those criticisms specifically as a story of trauma recovery I think the the sort of famous element of the myth where um, you know Cersei gets sexually assaulted and then turns uh, sailors into pigs um, plays a relatively small role in the plot and I don't necessarily think it's like written badly or anything but I just think for the amount of sort of praise that I had seen for that part of the story and how much it had been talked about in the reviews that I had read and sort of the way that this was framed as a story that was really largely about that kind of healing um, I really didn't think that it was super in-depth or you know interesting or memorable in that regard um, and I guess you can kind of see the story as her like overall overcoming, you know, kind of the the culture of of the gods and and their you know their tyranny and their cruelty and things like that. Um, I think you can look at it from a broader perspective like that. Um, but yeah, again, I just think you can make a lot of arguments about how it doesn't succeed super well as a feminist retelling, and the way that the sexual assault story storyline was handled was pretty um, just kind of lackluster to me. I also have a bit of a controversial opinion I think um, about the Strange the Dreamer duology by Lainey Taylor. This was really really popular in young adult fantasy circles a few years ago and it's just I think it still kind of holds a reputation for being very solid young adult fantasy. Um, I I don't know. Uh, so Laszlo, this is about um, Laszlo Strange. He's a young librarian who is sent on this expedition to a magical city where there's been this giant revolution and he has these dreaming abilities that help him connect with some of the, the sort of mythical people who have survived um, the city's downfall and learn about how that happened. Um, I think that's, I don't know, I read it a bit ago. That's kind of what I remember the summary being. But for me, this had really cool elements like the, the, the magical aspects of the story and the story of, you know, these sort of tyrants of the city and their downfall and how, you know, the people of the city are trying to find their way afterwards and, you know, trying to develop new lives and, and figure out how to kind of live in the wreckage of, of this city. All of that, I think, like, great premise, great ideas, and there was some good stuff there, but the downfall of this book for me is just that... It is so, so focused on this very, very bland instant love romance between Strange and um, I think her name is Sarai, Sarai or Sarai, um, who is one of the sort of the, the survivors, the magical survivors of the, of the, the coup of the city. And it was just like, I, I'm not necessarily opposed to there being a romance between them, but it was just so quick, so bland, like it just overshadowed everything that I thought was interesting and so I ended up thinking this was quite uh, this was just quite mediocre and I wish that we could have focused on the parts that I did actually find more engaging. Okay and then last but not least for this section is The Once and Future Witches by Alex E. Harrow and this is about three sisters in a alternative version of like turn of the century America they discover their suppressed magic and start building a feminist movement based on witchcraft. They have to kind of heal their sisterhood and explore their relationships and like really come together as women in order to like stop the forces that are trying to suppress them. I think the recurring theme of this section of this video is just I wish that I liked this book so much based on how it sounds like the vibes, the themes, I really wish that I just 100% loved Alex Haro's books, but they just never quite click for me. I definitely enjoy this to a certain extent. I just get very, very like emotionally compromised by any kind of plot where like women band together, like sisters come together, a feminist movement developments, and they like women come together to like overcome their trauma or oppression or or that kind of thing. Even if it's not done particularly well, it'll still get something out of me because I just am such a sucker and I love that kind of plot so much. I think that's kind of a similar response to uh, that I had to A Study in Drowning where it's like, I know this isn't done that well, but like it's still kind of getting to me. Um, but I just don't, like there's just a lot of things that felt very clunky about this to me. The characters themselves, the three main sisters, each one like just has like a very, very 
standard arc that she goes through to like learn a lesson and become you know learn a lesson based on her signature flaw and then she's a different you know she's stronger at the end of it that kind of thing um I also think that Harrow like tries to have a conversation about how we view feminism today as something that is very intersectional versus you know the way that it was very white focused and class classist and exclusionary at the time she has to tries to have a conversation about those kinds of things but in my view it just felt a little bit awkward like the way that she did it um, didn't quite resonate for me and then last but not least I think I've said this about a few in this section I just really really disliked both of the romance subplots they didn't work for me at all and um, yeah I'm pretty picky about my romances if they work for me they really work for me but if they don't they really don't and they usually drag a book down even if there's other parts of it that I like so again I, I definitely had an emotional reaction to this book and there were parts that I liked but just kind of clunky, kind of uh, very obvious character arcs and wish it had been more of what I liked and more of what I hoped it to be. And I think that's kind of where I want to end things today. Looking back over the books that I've read, I was really cool. I realized like, wow, I've actually read a lot for this project. It feels like I haven't been doing it that long, but I was really happy to see how much progress I'd made and how many things that I'd wanted to read I actually got to. To look back at the things that kind of topped the list for me, I realized prose is very important, like really beautiful writing um, is something that I will always love in a book. and. Uh, uh, the ending is also very important, like it looks like bittersweet endings, slightly ambiguous endings, or endings that are tragic but resonant in some way. Like those will absolutely make a book for me. And uh, then like really truly meaningful exploration of themes of like uh, gender, oppression, power, trauma, recovery, all of those things blended together tend to make a book really impactful for me. When I love a romance, I really love it. Like, I love the sort of sense of solidarity, like a very sweet, tender, gradual romance. Um, what else? I think when when it's, like speaking to the fantasy element specifically, I like magic and settings that are really weird and dark and do something with the world building that I haven't necessarily seen before. And I think that's kind of the summary when I'm looking back, like those are the common denominators that I see in the stuff that I really, really liked. As for the common denominators and things that I didn't like so much, I think conf like confusion or awkwardness or just like not being clear in what a book is trying to say when it's trying to make like a political statement or a statement about, a statement about you know, human nature or social justice or anything like that, um, when it seems to be very muddled or confused, either in what it's trying to say or in how it says it using the story. And also the stories where I don't necessarily feel like the book is trying to explore anything in depth, you know, where it might just be using these elements of, of violence or trauma for kind of shock value, to be gratuitous, to be, you know, to add some level of interest to the story that it might not have otherwise. Um, in the essay that I wrote and recorded on here where I kind of talked about that shock factor value, I think those stories just tend to feel kind of lazy and exploitative to me. And so there are definitely some here that fell in that category. And uh, otherwise, I think, you know, some of the stories were just were dragged down by, you know, general struggles like not very strong writing, not very strong characterization or character development, and uh, just not really having anything that super captivates my attention. Um, and then there's just a few, you know, that I think for one reason or another I just really wanted to love them, but they didn't quite meet me where I was hoping that they would. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for listening in today. I hope you found something interesting to read, something to add to your list, something to look into in more detail. If you want to read my full reviews of any of these books, I will have my uh, website posted below where I have all of those posted. And then I'll also make sure that I include the full Google Doc of everything that I have read and I'm planning to read for this project. And yeah, if you want to follow me on any of my social media, I guess all that's included below. I don't post anywhere super often. Um, 
but I do reblog a lot of uh, Dragon Age fan art on Tumblr, and I sometimes post stuff on Reddit, so that's a ringing endorsement for following me on social media. Um, my track record here is not great, I know, like I think it's maybe like every four to five months that I'm able to post something. I just don't really, still don't really know how to make videos that well. I don't find it like a super easy process and it's just a very busy time right now, but I have a lot of ideas of stuff that I would like to do and um, kind of have some things in progress. So if uh, if you want to, feel free to check out whatever I post next, feel free to say hi, feel free to follow along with other stuff in the meantime. But thank you so much again and take care.